All right, welcome uh, to the Living Kidney Donors Network webinar. Good evening. I'm Harvey Mysell. I will be facilitating tonight's webinar. I started LKDN in 2007 after my first kidney transplant. I had known about my kidney disease, PKD, uh, polycystic kidney disease, which is a genetic condition, for over 20 years. During that time, I was a volunteer promoting organ and tissue donor registration with my local OPO, that's the organ procurement organization. They uh, facilitate the deceased donations and encouraging people to register to, to be organ and tissue donors. Uh, and I watched the waiting list, uh, unfortunately, grew. Uh, when I was told that my kidneys had deteriorated and I'll need a transplant soon, I knew I was going to pursue a living donor, but I really had no idea how to go about the process. I looked for an organization that can help me understand living donation, uh, but didn't find one. Uh, what I really wanted to know is how do I go about asking someone to donate? After speaking to many donors and recipients, I realized that I didn't need to ask anyone to donate. I just had to tell my story. And if I was good at telling my story, it would be pretty obvious what my need was. More about telling your story uh, a little later. I was very fortunate that my wife was compatible with me. She was my donor, and we had our transplant in February of 2007. We both recovered quickly, and I realized that from what I learned, I can help others find their living donor. And that's when I started LKDN. About a year and a half after my transplant, I contracted the BK virus. Uh, as is the case with other viruses, you know, like the common cold, there's no treatment for the BK virus. And this virus, unfortunately, attacks the transplanted kid, uh, kidney. They still don't know why it does that, but uh, it is obviously unfortunate. As time went by, my kidney function declined, and in January 2012, I was told that I'll need another kidney transplant. After five years of helping others develop their own kidney campaign, it seemed a bit ironic to me that now I had to take my own advice and develop my kidney campaign. Uh, it was not easy to do, certainly. But I was very fortunate and that my donor, Stephen Leggio, and I connected through a mutual acquaintance, not a very close one, but she knew about my situation and Stephen's interest in donating. How Stephen and I connected was a bit unusual, but then again, all the stories I hear about donors and recipients meeting uh, and pairing up who didn't know each other before, even ones that did know each other before, are unique in their own way. And uh, there are many people that connect by uh, an advocate or a third party. Uh, Stephen is with us tonight, and he'll describe in a little more detail uh, about our experience and uh, certainly be there to answer any questions that you might have. My goal tonight is to help you understand the many different living donation options, also some deceased donation information which you may not be aware of, and provide you uh, with information on how to best develop your kidney campaign so you can be successful at finding your donor, or as I like to say, having your donor find you. Someone who might be willing to donate is unable to do so, unless they know about your situation. During the presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. There's a questions box on the bottom right-hand side uh, of the screen. Uh, so please go ahead and ask questions. And also next to your name, uh, there should be a place for you to raise your hand. And Stephen and I will watch this and uh, hopefully catch it during the webinar. But if not, we'll certainly get to those questions uh, afterwards. Um, so if you can, you know, take a look at that and ask the question during the presentation. Uh, so there are really too many people who have an open mic. It doesn't work very well, but there'll be plenty of time at the end of the uh, presentation. There's no need to take notes on what's on the slides. You'll receive a link to the LKDN website that will have a copy of this presentation and all the other materials and articles that I've referenced. Uh, I'll also show you that at the end just to give you an idea of where it's at. Well, now's a good enough time to, since I didn't, is to share the webcam or really open up the webcam. Excuse my headgear. Um, last night I didn't use it and we had some feedback, so I've put it again on this evening. You're able to resize that, so if you want to resize it, put it in a corner, or you can get rid of it if you want. I certainly uh, won't feel bad about that. 
So let's get started uh, with the evening. And, Harvey, uh, Sherry has a question for you right now. Sure. Sh Sherry, go ahead. Go ahead, Sherry. No question? Okay, she may have hit it inadvertently. All right. So our goals tonight, uh, uh, I've introduced you a little bit to LKDN, uh, and it'll be, a uh, presentation is going to be in two sections. First, to provide you with an overview, and the second half is to discuss how you can develop your kidney campaign. Uh, any questions regarding medical advice, obviously I can't answer. Um, and one thing that I often get questions about insurance, and it's very difficult uh, for me to uh, answer questions regarding insurance because they're so different. Uh, even the same insurance plan, uh, if it's two different companies or if it's the same insurance company, they may have two or three or four different plans, so it's never the same. Um, really build as much knowledge about the transplant process as you can. It builds confidence, makes it a lot easier to talk to people about your situation uh, and learn as much as you can about your situation. I'll give you uh, some stats. Uh, there are over 124,000 people waiting for all organs right now, 102,000 waiting for kidneys. And uh, that doesn't really show the need because there are about 400,000 people on kidney dialysis. And all of those people need a kidney transplant. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are not getting that information uh, or not getting on the list for many, many reasons. I'll talk a little bit about that later too. You should know that not all waiting lists are equal. I'll give you a good example. I'm in Chicago. The transplant hospitals in uh, downtown Chicago, the wait is four, five, six years. You know, your medical condition certainly impacts that. But up in Wisconsin, you can go to some transplant hospitals there, and the wait is 12, 14 months. Uh, you can multi-list. There's no, no reason you can't uh, uh, register at more than one transplant hospital. And uh, in fact, one of the uh, people I sent up there, they got a transplant in four months. So if you can uh, multi-list, if it's practical, uh, I would ad uh, advise you to do that. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, you'll get a link and describe how you can find out what the wait list is at your hospital and uh, other transplant hospitals. So this graph really uh, shows the challenge and the problem that we have. Uh, you know, the waiting list has grown dramatically uh, over the last 10 years and the number of transplants haven't grown, which is uh, very unfortunate. Here are two uh, websites you can, you can go to. Uh, they have a lot of information, stats, uh, et cetera. You can learn a lot more about the whole transplant process. They do have info on living donation, uh, survival rates. Uh, you know, most people starting dialysis were good candidates. It's uh, your health deteriorates when you're on dialysis, and uh, certainly if you get a transplant and you're on dialysis a long period of time, the outcomes uh, aren't as good. Uh, 15 people die every day waiting uh, for a kidney transplant, and last year there were just shy of 17,000 transplants. A uh, little over 11 were from uh, deceased donors and just under six from living donors. And unfortunately, as you saw, in the previous uh, graph here, it's flat. In fact, it's gone down in many years. Uh, in seven of the, whoops, sorry, in uh, seven of the last uh, nine years, the number of living kidney transplants have been lower than the previous year. And the same for deceased donor, not as bad, but four out of the last nine years. Uh, there'll be a link to an article that gives one reason uh, why, and I agree with the reason, but it's certainly not uh, the reason why all of the, those years and the, and the transplants have gone down. And basically the author says that on the living uh, donation side that uh, transplant hospitals are becoming a little pickier as to the donors that they're accepting and to the recipients that they're accepting, okay, making, you know, whether they're qualified either to be a donor or to get a transplant. And on the deceased donor side, many hospitals are not accepting the organs. So the process is, if an organ's available, uh, the uh, OPO, the Organ Procurement Organization, will call the hospital uh, where the patient is that, that uh, is being offered that organ. And if the hospital feels that that organ is not a good organ, they will reject it, and then they go to another hospital. 
It's also one of the reasons uh, people feel many organs are not used because it takes too much time. Uh, hey, Harvey, uh, a couple of people that. have posted on questions that they can't see the graph that you're referring to and they can only see the webcam. So you and might I don't, I don't see this? See the, I don't see the slides on my screen either. Ah. That'll work, hopefully. That better? Yep, now we see the slides. Uh, thanks, sorry about that. Uh, wonder why that disappeared, because we, we had that when we were testing it. Sorry about that. Uh, let me backtrack. There wasn't too you know much there in terms of slides to see these two websites. And again, you'll get a copy of this, so you don't need to write down the names of those uh, websites. Uh, here are just some statistics, but yeah, this is the graph I was talking about, uh, where the number of transplants has increased and the number of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the waiting list has increased and the number of transplants has stayed flat or has gone down. So sorry about that again. Um, it's widely uh, agreed and understood that uh, a living donor is significantly better than a kidney from a deceased donor. Short and long-term survival rates, uh, you know their donor's history, which is certainly very important. Um, the kidney almost always functions immediately. When it doesn't, they call it a sleepy kidney. And it happens about 30% of the time with deceased donor uh, kidneys. Uh, so certainly is beneficial. You have to go back on dialysis if you have a, a sleepy kidney. Uh, avoiding dialysis is certainly beneficial. They call it a preemptive transplant. Statistics show that once you're on dialysis for a year or more, it starts to negatively impact the, the outcomes. Um, and there's a significant cost savings for getting a kidney from a living donor. Uh, I'm sorry, getting a transplant rather than staying on kidney dialysis. Um, the cost savings would, would save Medicare, which does about 60% of the transplant, it would save them hundreds of millions of dollars a year. It's a, a significant savings. So the evaluation process, I won't get into it too much. Um, there, there isn't a national standard for evaluating donors or recipients. So if a donor is not accepted at one hospital, you may want to go to another hospital and see what they say. Same thing with the recipient. Okay, there, and I've had quite a few experiences uh, in both donors and recipients uh, telling them, go to another transplant hospital, and, and the other hospital says, yeah, we understand you have this condition, but we don't think it should preclude you. So there isn't a national standard. If you're uh, uh, refused at one hospital, you can go, you can go to another. Uh, also get a lot of calls, how many people uh, will be worked up, how many donors will they work up at one time. Some hospitals will do one. Uh, I know some hospitals will do up to three at a time. Again, it varies, uh, nothing, nothing standard. Uh, evaluation time, same thing. There isn't a, you know, an average, um, uh, but what I tell people is that the donor likely has more influence of moving the process forward. There's something about when the donor you know, gets on the phone and says, okay, what test do I need to take next? And then, and, and then what I advise you to do is find out when that test is, you know, taken, when the results are going to come, and what's the next step? What will I need to do after that? And Stephen was a champ at our hospital. I think they said their average is 72 days. He did it in 40 days. Um, so a lot has to do with whether or not the donor is uh, staying on top of it. Uh, and I'm often asked also, can out-of-towners be evaluated while they're out of town? Most hospitals will do that. They'll send out blood, uh, a box of vials to be, you know, that you can uh, uh, go to a local clinic and then mail it back. Of course, you'll have to make trips to the hospital uh, eventually, but a lot of work could be done uh, from a distance. Uh, and you've, one of the things also is some donors come back from the evaluation and they say, gee, they really don't want me to donate or they're making it sound like they don't want me to donate. And that typically isn't the case, but um, they want to make sure you're doing it for the right thing or the donor is doing it for the right thing. Uh, and you have to remember, you know, they, they took an oath first, do no harm, and they are doing harm to a very healthy person. So it's a, a little bit of a challenge sometimes uh, for the information that's provided. They'll go over, you know, the anticipated and, you know, there are unanticipated surgical 
complications, uh, the major risk is going under um, uh, anesthesia. You know, they do the procedure laparoscopically, but you know, the donor will be in pain, they'll be tired, they'll be in discomfort, and it ranges. You know, people deal with pain very, very differently. Uh, there are some links to articles about long-term risks. Uh, they show that there aren't any uh, long-term risks for someone to donate, uh, that living with one kidney is, is not uh, a challenge in the future. Uh, although some people who donate will uh, need a, uh, a kidney transplant in the future. It's, uh, they don't understand why. Their feeling is that these people likely would have needed a kidney transplant anyway, but it's a very low number, about 1 or 2 percent of the donors uh, that donate. Um, and uh, donor follow-up, uh, a couple of years ago, UNOS uh, finally passed a, a donor follow-up program, so the donor needs to uh, be followed up six months, one year, and two years after the transplant. Uh, I call that a good start, but it's not nearly sufficient. Uh, we need a much longer follow-up program uh, for donors. Also, most hospitals are doing a three-month follow-up, uh, too. Uh, one of the things about the donor insurance is that many, or probably most hospitals, will not accept a donor without health insurance. And it's not because they want to use that health insurance for the transplant. That's from the recipient, OK? So if things go smoothly, the donor shouldn't get anything from regarding the uh, medical uh, workups. Why they want the donor have insurance is, let's say, during the process, they uncover something that has nothing to do with the transplant, and some tests need to be done then the donor's insurance would need to pick that up because it has nothing to do with the transplant. And there are also situations, and I've spoken to a few people, where during the workup they found a very serious medical condition. And that needs to be taken care of immediately. And it's awkward for the hospital to say, gee, you don't have insurance, can you go somewhere else? So it's very awkward um, and for the insurance uh, uh, for the donor and it is definitely an issue and needs to be addressed in the future. You can purchase a catastrophic policy for the, for the donor. That's the name of the organization. Again, uh, you'll have all the contact information uh, for them. And basically, like I said, it's catastrophic health insurance and life insurance for one year. And so that can be purchased. Uh, some hospitals purchase it on behalf of the donor. Um, one issue also for the donor is future health and life insurance. The health insurance shouldn't be an issue anymore. The Affordable Care Act uh, said that you can't uh, decline someone because of a pre-existing condition, um, and some health insurance companies were doing that, not if you're part of a group plan, but if you went to get individual insurance. So that's no longer a challenge, although the, what the insurance costs still is not clear, but at least they can get insurance. And the other is uh, life insurance. Uh, some people say that they uh, pay a higher premium or the life insurance companies are not offering it. I've heard that. So these are things that they should look into beforehand. But that's not across the board. And I know my wife purchased life insurance after she donated. There were no issues uh, at all with that. So the, again, there isn't a, a standard uh, for that. Let me talk about the term match or matching. Uh, it really isn't used appropriately, not that that's too much of a problem, but just kind of understand the whole matching process. I prefer to use the term suitable and compatible. A suitable donor is someone who's healthy enough to donate. A uh, compatible donor is someone that is compatible with their intended recipient. So I much prefer to kind of use those terms. Now, there are two very important parts of uh, compatibility. One is called PRAs, okay, panel reactive antibodies. It's a simple blood test that's done on the recipient. Uh, if you are registered uh, uh, to get a transplant, they've already done this. It's one of the earliest tests they do, and it measures the antibodies that's in the recipient's blood. They're measured from zero to 100. I kind of call this the second most important blood test. Um, and so uh, if your antibodies are zero, which is good, is make it much easier to find a compatible donor. The higher your antibodies, the more difficult it is uh, to find that compatibility. So uh, they're measured, like I said, 0 to 100. And there are three ways these antibodies develop. 
One is from a previous transplant, two is from a blood transfusion, and the third is that not, not all women, but some women from the birthing process. That will increase your antibodies. Now they can do things to lower these antibodies. It's called plasmapheresis. It's basically a cleansing of the blood. It's very expensive, but they do do it in certain situations. I've helped many people who have had PRAs in their 90s get a kidney transplant. In fact, earlier this year, a woman who I've been helping for four years got a transplant. Her PRA was 100. They found, she found a donor, not compatible. They got involved in a paired exchange, which we'll talk about, and then the hospital lowered her PRA a little bit to become compatible with someone. So it can happen. The other compatibility is blood type, and we'll talk a little bit about blood type uh, compatibility in a few minutes. The most important blood test is the cross match, and the cross match is a blood test where they take the donors and recipients blood, they mix them together, and you want a negative cross match. Positive means that the recipient is fighting the blood and they would reject the kidney, so that person cannot donate. They'll usually do a cross match early in the process, and they'll do it again right before the transplant. Stephen will talk about that uh, a little bit about how that works. HLAs, these uh, are what was commonly referred to as being, quote, matched or the perfect match. There are these six antigens, and before the uh, current immunosuppressant drugs, you really needed a perfect match uh, because people would reject. Now, with the anti-rejection drugs that they use, matching is no longer what it used to be, and I'll show you a couple of things here uh, that reflect that. Um, so on this bar graph here, you'll see this first bar underneath that says it, it groups all the donors and recipients that had a zero match or a five out of six match. And they group them together because there isn't a significant difference in the outcomes if you're a zero or a five. However, as you see, you get that perfect match and the outcome does get significant. And the same thing with living donors. Um, and obviously you can see here with a living donor, perfect match, uh, longevity is significant, uh, significantly better. Uh, what I say to people is a uh, kidney from a, a living donor lasts on average twice as long as one from a deceased donor. And the number here where this is the point in time where 50% of the kidneys are still functioning. So let's just take this graph over here. 17.8 years, half of the kidneys have failed, but half of the kidneys are still functioning. So that's what this, they call it a, a half-life. Hopefully you kind of understand that. Uh, here's a little bit about blood type compatibility. Uh, basically, an O donor, okay, can donate to every single blood type, okay? And an AB recipient can receive a transplant from every blood type, okay? So if you're a donor, you'd like to be an O. If you're a recipient, you'd like to be AB. Very few ABs, a little less than half are Os, okay? Now I put here in red, some As can donate to an O. So an A can donate to an A or an AB, and some uh, sub subgroups of A. So if you have an A donor and you're an O recipient, it's possible that you can be compatible. And the plus and minus are not a factor when it comes to uh, kidney transplants. It's a factor in blood transfusions, but not transplants. Let's talk about the different um, living donation options. There's the related, okay, brother, sister, parent. Ten years ago, most of the transplants were from related donors. Now, certainly not as many. Again, to go back to the immunosuppressant drugs, that's the reason why. You don't need that blood relative. Non-related, spouse, friend, uh, et cetera. And there are these kidney paired donations or paired exchanges. They also call swaps or chains. And we'll talk a little bit about them. A paired exchange works when we have a donor recipient they're not compatible, and another donor recipient not compatible. So what they do is they put them together. Donor one will donate to the other recipient, donor two to, the, to this recipient. Very simple, but they've done up to a 30 pair exchange. And these are starting to become very, very powerful in terms of helping people 
about a third of all donors that go in to get evaluated to donate to someone are not compatible with that person. In the past, they said, thank you, go home. Now they can help that individual. There's another type of living donor uh, uh, transplant option, and that's with a non-directed donor. A non-directed donor is someone who says, I want to donate a kidney. I don't know anyone in need, but I'd like to help someone. I've helped many non-directed donors through the process, and they have a tremendous amount of, of power in terms of helping many people. There are two kinds of non-directed donors. One is called the domino paired exchange. Like with the example we gave before, it starts out the same way, but donor two is not compatible with either recipient one or two. So enter the non-directed donor. You have another donor. You have a recipient. And now we start, donor one donates to recipient two, donor two to recipient three, and the non-directed donor to recipient one. One of the interesting things here about recipient three is that person comes from the waiting list. That would be a, certainly a very pleasant surprise when that happens. Here's a, a photo, uh, this woman, Kara Yesowich, uh, who I helped, uh, came to me, wanted, uh, was interested in being a donor. Uh, didn't know anyone in need, and she got involved in an eight-way paired exchange. It's uh, really quite amazing how how one person can help so many. There's something else a non-directed donor can get involved with. It's called an ongoing or a never-ending chain. And the difference here between the domino paired exchange, uh, they, they call it a domino because the, the uh, non-directed donor is the domino. It makes all the others fall into place. Kind of a cute name. But on the ongoing, there isn't a third recipient here, okay? So what happens is that we have an extra donor. This donor is not used in this group. And they can start another, they call the bridge donor, they can start another chain next week, next month, and they take, play the role of the non-directed donor. And in that chain, there will be an extra donor. And it can go on and on, that's why they call it you know, never ending, or in theory could be never ending. One organization had 15 iterations from one donor. Uh, last year, I don't know if you read uh, about it, May of 2013, there was a 28 pair exchange, uh, started with one non-directed donor. Uh, my uh, web designer got his second transplant in that uh, 28 pair, it was very, very exciting. Um, if you're interested, send me an email. I don't have it on the website, but I have a list of all of the donor recipients that participated in that. It's really, uh, really quite amazing. Excuse me. There's something called a compatible paired exchange. And a compatible paired exchange is when you have a donor and recipient, and they're compatible. Okay, so they can go ahead with the transplant, but they want to get involved in a paired exchange. And the, the couple of reasons, one is they just want to help other people, okay, get a transplant, but the recipient should benefit in a compatible paired exchange. And the recipient should benefit in one of three ways. One might be to get a better matched kidney. I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, the second, maybe uh, uh, their, their donor is, let's say, 54 years old, and they're ending up with a donor that's 35 years old. And the third way they might benefit is maybe the recipient is 185 or 200 pounds and their donor is 125 pounds. Not ideal. Okay, you'd want to try to match that up. So that would be a reason why a compatible, why you would get involved in a compatible paired exchange. Not only to help others, but also possibly to help yourself. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, in a minute or so, but these compatible paired exchanges, I think, will start to become popular when there is just one pool of all incompatible pairs. Because paired exchanges basically are a numbers game. If you're in a pool with 20 incompatible pairs and there's another pool of 150 incompatible pairs, it's more likely you're going to find that match uh, in, the, in the larger pool. Um, you know, there are some variations that, you know, wouldn't make that happen. You know, if everybody had a high PRA or a difficult blood type, but that's usually not the case. But we don't have that one pool uh, yet, and I'll, I'll talk about this. 
uh, a little later. This could be a good time for Stephen to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, kind of how we met um, and a little bit of, uh, of our experience. Uh, Stephen? Thanks, Harvey. Um, in February of 2012, I decided that I wanted to become a living kidney donor. And I wasn't really sure um, how to go about the process of finding someone. I didn't have anyone that, that was in need of a kidney. So I, I just did a quick web search um, for living kidney donations, and Harvey's website, the LKDN, was the first one that came up. I sent Harvey an email, and there were a couple other organizations um, that I sent emails to just asking about what the, the first steps are if you want to become a donor. Harvey replied right away with some information about um, different organizations to contact to begin the process. Um, and I started looking into those, and about two weeks later, another woman that I had sent that initial email to contacted me, and she gave me the same information Harvey did, and she said that she was also advocating for a couple of people that she knew, kid, knew uh, that needed kidneys, and she said one of them was this guy, his name is Harvey, he lives in Chicago, and um, I was really um, touched by the fact that when I contacted Harvey to find out information about becoming a donor, he was in need of a kidney, and uh, he didn't tell me about his need. He put he put the process ahead of his own needs, and uh, at that moment, I decided that I wanted to offer him my kidney. So I sent Harvey an email offering him my kidney. Uh, this would have been probably the middle of February. Um, he called, and we talked on the phone and um, got to know each other a little bit, and he explained the process and got me in touch with the transplant coordinator at uh, the hospital he was going through. Uh, I contacted them, uh, started the process from Michigan. Uh, they sent some vials. I did all the blood work and everything. And uh, things went smoothly at first. And I think at the beginning of April, I had to travel to Chicago to have uh, some testing and evaluation done at the hospital. And Harvey and I met uh, for the first time. My wife came. And we met Harvey and his wife, Amy, and uh, we became very close very quickly. And um, uh, we just went about the process. So we were approved pretty quick. I don't know. When were we approved? Do you remember, Harvey? Uh, what was it? I think we had a June 7th date. So I probably middle of May, early May, something like that, I guess. And I, so sure. so the week, June, I think June 7th was the, the date of the surgery was scheduled. Uh, it was a Thursday. So the Monday before the surgery, they sent for more blood work, and they did a final cross match. And at that time, um, we were no longer compatible. Maybe Harvey can explain to you what happened as to why we were no longer compatible. Yeah, what uh, is not unusual, um, or I shouldn't say is not rare, for this to happen. And I, I told Stephen that this might happen because I had a previous transplant, and as I explained, that increases your PRA. But when they did my uh, initial PRA, it was zero, and I told them, well, it can't be zero, I had a transplant. And they said, yeah, it happens to people, you know, that even though I had a transplant or blood transfusion or whatever, your PRA is still zero. But I was still very cautious and uh, expressed this to Stephen that, you know, it's a little bit of unusual, so don't be surprised if that were to change. And and unfortunately, it did change. Um, and so uh, Stephen and I then uh, started registering, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes, uh, at different transplant hospitals um, for different paired exchange programs. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to cover with that, Stephen, or you know, people may no, have some questions. Uh, uh, yeah. No, the one, the one thing I want to tell people is that um, it's what you said earlier is that you don't need to ask someone to donate a kidney. All you need to do is uh, communicate your story because there are people out there who uh, you don't even know right now and don't know you who want to help. And the more you get your story out there, the greater chance you have of finding that person and making that connection. Yeah, and a, a quick story about someone else that I helped happens to live near me, and I'm starting to meet some people finally near me and, and so I can actually meet them. Um, because I helped so many over the phone, which is, which is great. But he was very afraid to tell people about his need. And he told his gardener, the gardener's staff, not even the lead gardener. 
and one day because I told him you need to just tell everybody you know the the because Starbucks baristas donate cashiers at grocery stores donate cab drivers donate and the only reason they know is because someone told them so he told his gardener and the very next day his gardener's the gardener's girlfriend wrote him an email and said I'm going to be your donor and she ended up being his donor it, it, and these are not you know one in a million anymore you know Stephen and I are not one in a million and we'll talk a little bit more about how to get those stories um, so a little bit more about paired exchanges because they're not all what they seem to be unfortunately so I wrote an article you get a link to it. it's called the paired exchange conundrum so if I, I've explained how paired exchanges work and and this you know I'd known about this for a while but it didn't hit home until it really happened to me and so what happens you if you have an incompatible pair your hospital will say to you okay we have a paired exchange program we'll put you in our paired exchange program which is great okay wonderful however there are many different paired exchange programs if there are two or three hospitals or whatever where you live transplant hospitals and you're in, you have you're an incompatible pair at one hospital there may be the perfect other incompatible pair at the other hospital for you and if they're not talking to each other which is likely the case you will never find out so when you want to pursue or if you need to pursue a paired exchange you not only need to register at your transplant hospital but you might need to register at many other hospitals and this article gets into a lot more detail about how you do that I will go over one thing uh, regarding these paired exchanges there are three organizations here are their names National Kidney Registry UNOS which is the organization that does the deceased donation and the Alliance for Paired Donation they do paired exchanges they don't do the procedure oversimplifying it here they have a computer and their computer matches up incompatible pairs and so they encourage transplant hospitals they act like a co-op they encourage transplant hospitals to give them all of their incompatible pairs so they can put them in their computer and work work you know you know find make it better to make it easier and better to find uh, a compatible pair so a hospital could uh, again uh, I'll take uh, let's take Johns Hopkins okay they do an incompatible pair program within their hospital and they happen to get together with their local hospitals most regional hospitals don't get together with their competitors so to speak in the area okay so you would need to do that um, and then a hospital can sign up with one of these three two of these three or all of these three there's no limitation for that so what what happened with Stephen and I when when I found out we were no longer compatible I got back to my hospital within a couple of days and said expect to hear from these hospitals and organizations because I want to uh, get listed in other paired exchange programs and Stephen was more than willing to go ahead because it, it's a big effort uh, to start being tested at other organizations so you'll get the contact information from these uh, three groups but you don't want to contact these groups you want to contact a hospital that is affiliated with one of these groups because they're the ones that will evaluate you and put you on their list so you're not going to be contacting them what you'll get is information on uh, their affiliate hospitals and so you can try to find one uh, that's near you uh, UNOS is fairly new in this they've just been doing it for a couple of years uh, Alliance has been around for a while the National Kidney Registry is doing more than all of them and they've been around the longest but that doesn't mean that should be the only place for you to go okay but they are doing more um, I've sent people to all of them I've had people at transplants with all of the the, the programs uh, a little more information uh, about the process you know I speak to people and they say hey I have a donor great we're going ahead you don't have a donor until the transplant so I encourage people to continue looking for other donors and say listen I have someone we're going through the process should something happen we can use you as a backup so don't stop the process continue until the transplant 
in fact, the, the nurses, uh, my first transplant, I didn't wake up in the recovery. I woke up in the, in the room sometime later. But my second, I woke up in recovery and the nurses were laughing at me. I woke up and I asked them, did the transplant happen? And they thought that was pretty funny. But you just don't know. There are people that get turned away at the hospital. Much more on the deceased side that happens, but it could happen. There are going to be changes in the deceased donor waiting list next month. They've been trying to make these changes for 10 years. Um, you'll find links that you can read about these changes. There are two significant ones. The first one is for people that are mostly on dialysis. What would happen very often is someone would start dialysis, let's say on January 1, and they might not get on the list for six months, a year, or even two years. Okay. So what they're doing now is, should that happen, your, your, your wait time will start when you started dialysis. So you won't lose that time. If you're currently on dialysis and that happened to you, it will be retroactive. So that's going to start. So if you're on dialysis now and you know that you started bef well before you got on the list, talk to your dialysis clinic and find out how they're going to communicate that with your transplant hospital. The other major change is right now, if a deceased donor kidney becomes available, let's say from a 30-year-old, and the next person on the list is 62 years old, they get that organ. But with the new allocations, they're going to take the, the, the best 15% uh, of kidneys from deceased donors, which will mostly be younger people, and the best uh, uh, people on the waiting list, which will be younger people, you'll get they'll give points to those two. So uh, the scenario I gave you about the young person, the old person getting the young kidney, that won't happen in the future. We'll see how that impacts people ages 50 plus. It'll take a couple of years to get some data, but they, they say it's not going to have a huge impact. We'll see. Uh, the donors have their own medical team and advocates at the transplant hospital. As I said, if, it don't, if your donor isn't uh, accepted, you can always go to another hospital. I would encourage you to, if you're, being, uh, if you're on the list, to take good care of your dental health. Many people are told at the end they won't give them a transplant because poor dental health. There are issues with dental health and cardiac, and so they're concerned about that. Um, paying donors is in the, uh, in the news a fair amount lately. Uh, my previous newsletters, you can look at those. I've got a lot of stories if you want to uh, read more about it and learn some of my points of view on that. Uh, you can reimburse a donor for expenses, travel expenses, you know, uh, uh, planes, hotels, meals, things like that, um, and lost wages, okay? Some people uh, uh, do uh, uh, fundraising events uh, for that. Here's the name of an organization that helps with fundraising events. Uh, they do a great job. They're non nonprofit, um, and that's becoming uh, even more common. Um, as, as, as time goes by. So you can uh, look at that. Uh, also, don't be uh, afraid of uh, or intimidated by doctors and, and, and some of these acronyms. I've used a, a couple already uh, here, HLAs, PRAs, uh, a blood test is, uh, or getting your blood type is called an ABO. Uh, so kind of don't be intimidated by them. Ask, what are they? You know, wh what did you mean by that? I don't understand. Uh, and also come in with a list of questions and make sure those questions get answered. Ask the doctor to stay or the nurse to stay that you have more questions. Because we often do, you know, just don't just nod there. And I'm as guilty as doing that as anyone. It's not easy to grab the docs and make sure that they answer your questions. But you have a right to get those questions answered. Let's talk a little bit about communicating your need and the things that you can do for that. Um, you know, mostly it's concerns and, and, and trying to overcome them. And again, telling your story. And the best way to get good at telling your story is practice. Uh, this isn't the first time I've done this webinar, but I could tell you that the first time I did it, by now I was not on camera because I was sweating and very uncomfortable, and that's just natural, okay? So the more you tell your story, the easier it'll get. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, advocates, uh, you know, Stephen and I met uh, via an advocate. Many people are meeting via advocates. So try to get others to help you in the process and educating them. 
uh, about where you're at so they can properly describe what's going on. Social media networking, I mean, I remember years ago if I saw a Facebook page that someone was looking for a kidney, I'd post it and send it out to everybody. There are hundreds, there are probably thousands of them uh, out there, but they're effective. They are very, very effective, and I'll show you how you can uh, uh, get some of those stories. And your kidney campaign is going to be different, and finding your donor is going to be a different and your experience is going to be different but I encourage you to still speak to other donors other recipients and learn about you know what their experience was but remember it's just one experience okay you're not getting a big sample so try to use either organizations like mine to find out what generally is expected or the doctors um, and the uh, uh, professional staff at the hospital and the dialysis clinic um, and be as creative as you can be. You know, let it be handing out flyers, putting up bulletin boards. I mean, there, there really is no limitation as to what you can do to help get the word out. Um, and remember, you're not asking someone to donate. Okay, so you need to develop what your strategy is. How, what are you most comfortable with? Are you comfortable with email? Would you like writing out a letter? Letter. Would you rather make a phone call to people? Would you rather ask them to meet for a cup of coffee? Um, find out what your comfort level is and what you want to do and how you want to develop the process. And do one thing at a time. Don't you know, try to uh, uh, attack uh, this in many different ways. Come up with one idea, take care of it, and then go on uh, to, to others. Um, I do send out a monthly newsletter that has information. And I send out an email on Mondays. It's called Tuesdays with uh, Updates. And the idea came from uh, Tuesdays with Maury, which was a wonderful book. Um, and so what it is is, let's say if I was sending it out, it would be Tuesdays, uh, Tuesdays with Harvey. And it would be an email that I would send out to people updating them on my situation. So if, you, if, you can, if you'll sign up for them, on Monday, I'll send you a Tuesday's update with ideas on what you can send out on a Tuesday, and you can enhance it. You can add to it or skip a week, um, and all of this is on our website, and you can, uh, you can take a look at it. Uh, it's somewhat like uh, looking for a job. I don't know if uh, anyone has done that recently, but when you're networking or looking for a job, there are 50 things you can do, 60 things you can do. But there isn't one thing that will work. And it's the same thing here. You've just got to touch bases in doing many different things to get the word out uh, for your situation. Um, one of the things that I found that was helpful for me and, and many others is I developed a business card that I've handed out or sent to people. And they could use uh, my advocate. So I'll give you a second to, to read the back of the uh, of the business card. So it's just some simple information. Uh, include the uh, uh, name of the donor coordinator at the transplant hospital. Um, and I encourage people not only to have a Facebook page, but to have a website. And the reason being that a Facebook page is good for uh, uh, letting people know something. You know, sending a message out. But it's not very good at providing information or location where people can get information. And that's what um, uh, is good for, for a website that's there. Now, what you can also do is develop a flyer. And I developed the flyer. Uh, this is the one that I developed. Uh, someone asked me afterwards, why didn't you put your photo on the flyer? I have no answer for that. Uh, so it's probably a good idea to put your photo or some photo uh, on the flyer. And so uh, what you can do is your friends or family members will say, what can I do to help? And so you can say, you can help me put these flyers up, whether they live in your city or somewhere else. doesn't make any difference. On bulletin boards, Starbucks, uh, supermarkets, places of worship, there's no shortage of public bulletin boards out there. And what I did uh, for people when they, when they wanted to do that is I not only sent them uh, the flyer, but I sent them uh, business cards and uh, told them to put a piece of double face tape at the bottom and just stick the cards on there so uh, people can take them. And I 
did it locally and uh, would go back to it and fill in the business cards when, uh, when they were missing. Uh, quick story, my wife, we live in Chicago. One day she gets a call from her friends in Tucson and she says, I'm sitting in a bar Starbucks. How did Harvey get his flyer out here? You know, and we had some friends that were going out there and they put some flyers uh, while they were there. So there's no, again, no shortage of, of things that you can do. And you'll get links to my flyers and others that people have used. Uh, so you can get some ideas on, on, on doing that. I want to emphasize the advocate again, very important. Uh, educate them, uh, share, share, you know, give them an update, share the information, because the better they are in describing your situation, the more likely uh, uh, that they'll find success there also. And really the best advocate is someone who was evaluated to donate, but wasn't suitable, you know, had a medical condition. So they can start the conversation out by saying, you know, I really wanted to donate to so and so, but I have this medical condition precludes me from from donating. Uh, so there are really many things an advocate can, can say that you may not be comfortable saying to people or reaching out to certain groups of people that you may not be reaching out to. And you know, don't forget your book clubs, your uh, Rotary, Kiwanis, all of those groups, uh, uh, your religious uh, uh, organization. It, it, Try to get involved in many places that brings you out of the house where you're meeting new people all the time. And there are dozens of those in every city, everywhere now, let it be for hobbies or business or others. There's really no, no shortage uh, of those at all. Um, I have something, uh, if it is of interest, I've spoken to many Rotary and Kiwanis clubs, educating them about living donation and non-directed donation. They're short, 15-minute uh, presentations. That's all the time they give you. And I start the uh, presentation. I ask everyone to raise their hand if they're familiar with a program that registers to be an organ and tissue donor. Everyone raises their hand. And I compliment it and tell them that I still volunteer to, to uh, educate people about uh, registering uh, uh, with the DMV. Then I talk for 15 minutes about living donation. And before I leave, I ask everyone to raise their hand again if they learn something about living donation that really surprises them. And everybody raised their hand because people don't know. We've done an excellent job. We have a Donate Life Month, okay, all about deceased donation. Not saying anything negative about that. I still volunteer. We still need to educate people. But something needs to be done to educate the public about living donation. So we're trying to do some of these programs. If this is of interest to you, you can contact me and I can uh, uh, give you the information. If you're in need of a kidney transplant, I would say at the end of the presentation, you can take 30 seconds and say, I'm one of those people. I'm in need of a transplant. I think that would be a, a good outlet. Uh, we've talked a, a lot about these uh, beforehand. Articles, I've had articles written about me. Uh, these are good, heartwarming stories. Pe you know, uh, local uh, journalists, they want things like this. Uh, uh, schools and churches reunions, they're great outlets uh, for, for people. Um, and you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared to tell your story, okay? Facebook, email, blogs, uh, et cetera. Uh, great outlets, I described, you know, why, why you should use both Facebook uh, and having a, uh, a web page. Write out your story. It would be very important for you to write out your story. Maybe a journalist, uh, you can send it to journalists in your area. There are lists. Uh, you'll, you'll get a list of all the newspapers nationally. So you can find out ones in your area and you can start writing to them to get a story out. Uh, you, know, they're, you know, those lit bulletin boards have had uh, uh, donor information. Uh, about it or they buy a bulletin board uh, that's there. There really is no limit. Also, if you want to read stories every day, go to Google. Yahoo has one. Uh, sign up for alerts. You put in um, a keyword, transplant, kidney, living donation, uh, polycystic kidney disease, whatever you want to put in, and you'll get emails with those articles every day. We post some on our Facebook page so you can follow us there. We also have an attachment page, you know, tons of stuff in there. Um, I often ask, being asked questions about Craigslist, matching donors, is another company like a matching donors, Connectology. Uh, the latter two charge you money. 
uh, some significant amount of money uh, to be listed there. They're, they are finding donors for people. So in my mind, if it's not going to hurt you and you can afford to do it, you know, that's your decision. I will uh, uh, raise a red flag here for any time you are in touch with someone that you don't know, you meet on the internet or matching donors or wherever. And immediately, like on the back of the business card, it gives the, uh, uh, the name of the living donor coordinator. You get that person to call the living donor coordinator. If they don't call you know, within a couple of days or whatever short period of time, that should raise a red flag for you. So you should be concerned about that. Um, t-shirts, flyers, I see t-shirts on the internet all the time. If you follow our Facebook page, I think there were three t-shirts shown la just last week uh, that people are using to, uh, to really get the word out. All right, some talking points. You, you need to sit in front of the mirror or talk or, or practice in, uh, with a friend or family member. And it's a simple uh, uh, talking point. What are you going to say? What is that elevator speech, that 20, 30 seconds when that's all you have? Uh, what are you going to say? Because we all have experiences where it's at the end of the day, and nothing to do with needing a kidney transplant, but it's the end of the day, and you bumped into Sue, and you said, gee, I forgot to tell Sue something or other that was on your mind. The reason you forgot, because it wasn't top of mind. You have that. Uh, opportunity, it's a short window, a very small window. If you don't grab that opportunity, it kind of floats away. So be prepared. It, here's an idea of my talking points, let's say before uh, my last transplant. I meet someone at a party and I, they're coming over to me. I say, gee, I haven't seen Jim in quite a while, probably doesn't know about my situation. Jim says, how are you? People say, how are you? Every day, they're giving you the floor. If you're ready, you'll, you'll, you'll tell them. So Jim says, how are you? Well, not really great. Uh, I think you know I had a kidney transplant, but I developed this virus that attacked the kidney, and I need another transplant. So I'm pursuing you know, a living donor. A uh, kidney from a living donor lasts on average about twice as long as one from a, living don uh, from a deceased donor. So I'm getting the word out and letting others know about my situation. Okay, That's 20, 30 seconds. You need to develop your own 20 or 30 seconds so when the opportunity is there, you can go ahead and grab it. Um, in the workshops that I do uh, in person, what we, we, we do this and then we pair off with people. And I say, okay, you're at a party and someone, you know, this whole same scenario and then we pair off and we start practicing. And so you need to practice. You need to go ahead and do it two, three, four, or five times before you start feeling really comfortable. And the thing with practice is the more you practice, the better you get, okay? And that's exactly what happens when you get lucky, okay? The harder I work, the luckier I get, okay? So be prepared, okay? It's, it's in life. It's, it's, it's almost in everything we do, okay? So work on it, and I promise you it'll get easier as you go ahead. Uh, so I gave you my elevator speech a minute ago. Again, can't emphasize preparation uh, enough. All right, you can get your pen out. Here's what you need to write down. So www.lkdn.org slash webinar. If you put that into a browser, this is what you'll see. There's an evaluation form, and I would appreciate it if you can fill it out. It's always helpful for me. Uh, to know some of the things that worked or some of the things that are not working, others things that you wish we would have talked about. Um, and then you'll scroll down to the bottom. The first link here is a handout uh, of this webinar. It's a uh, PowerPoint in a handout form. So you can see all of the slides that are there and many, many other articles and information uh, that is here. This is all in addition to just going through the website and finding uh, other information that, uh, that is here. Again, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, like us on the Facebook page if you haven't yet. Um, let's see, how do I get back here? No, 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 that'll be it. Sorry. Um, 
like us on our Facebook page. If you're not getting our newsletter, there are links to the newsletter on the home page where you can sign up or send me an email. Uh, same thing for the Tuesdays with uh, updates. So you'll have all of those things uh, that are there. Also, there's something that I call a get together. We could do this with your friends and family members. You can invite them to your house and say, you know, I'm, I, I want to get the word out and I'd like for you to be an advocate for me. And we'll do a presentation just like this. But we'll have an open mic and there'll be questions back and forth. Um, and it'll, it'll, you know, also I'll learn a little bit more about your situation and we'll be able to uh, bring some of that into, into play there. So if that's of interest, uh, certainly, certainly let me know. Uh, learn as much as you can about living donation um, and the waiting list is certainly not the only option and there are a couple options with the waiting list uh, also so don't be afraid in looking into uh, uh, multi-listing uh, you know the donor matching has changed you don't need that perfect match that could be part of your talking points uh, to people and again incompatible pairs are starting to become uh, a, a good outlet for people and you know, if I had to pick one outlet, I'd say social media is really opening the door for many people. Stay motivated. I know it's not easy, especially if you're on dialysis. I was on dialysis uh, five months uh, before my transplant, so I know how difficult uh, it can be. Um, you know, building your knowledge will help. Continue to reach out, and you're not alone. Uh, send, send some emails, uh, visit on Facebook, ask some questions on Facebook, or start answering some of the questions on Facebook. The one thing about Facebook that many people aren't aware of, and we've had a few people meet on Facebook and um, a donor recipient uh, on our Facebook page, is that if you like us, that's great. You'll get uh, what we post, but you won't see what other people post. You need to come to the website for that. So I would encourage you to start uh, possibly visiting the website because there are people that say, I'm interested in being a donor. I'd like to learn more about it. And so that could be an opportunity uh, for you. So let's uh, open it up with uh, some Q&A. And uh, for Stephen or myself, you can uh, you know, raise your hand, ask a question. Um, did anyone print? Uh, OK, so we had some early questions. Uh, let me see. Janet, you had a question about the cost of going. Let me try to find you there. Open up your mic. Uh, could you, <laughs> Janet, could you get a little more detail as to what your question was? Yeah, my question is, um, can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. OK. My question is, um, I have a friend that said he'd be a donor. Well, I'll put the two together. And um, I've just had a kidney transplant that failed the first day, second day. And I'm in recovery for that, and I'm up for another one, and I'm very high on the list. And I'm still trying to find donors. Um, and one of these donors said to me, I'll only do it at John Hopkins. And I live in California. So I'm just talk I'm, I'm concerned because I, I really like where I am. I like the doctors that I have. And I have a huge support system here. And uh, at some levels, I feel like this donor is just manipulating me and has not taken into consideration at all the impact it will have on me, as cost of where to stay afterwards, my aftercare, all of that stuff. And I just wonder what your reaction was, if I should re-pursue this or what I should do. I don't even know if he's a match. Yeah, well, obviously that would be the first part. Does he live in Maryland? No, he lives in Southern California. And I asked him if he would at least go through here locally in Seattle, where I live, if he was a match, if he would see if he's a match, and he wouldn't even go that far. So I've well, sort of let him go. That's a little. That's a little strange. I, I the questions I would ask him is why. 
and I'm guessing he feels more comfortable with the quality of care. Is that fair to say? I guess. I don't know. I think where I am has great quality of care. Well, I think you need to find out why. Okay, certainly. Yeah. And if it is a quality of care, well, you don't know what it is, but if it is a quality of care, then what I would try to have him do is talk to some people uh, at your transplant hospital and see if you can, you know, move the needle in, in, in terms of comfort level, if that's it. I think that's the first question uh, you need to discuss. And regarding compatibility, that that would be primary because if if uh, if he's not compatible, then you've got different issues. Okay, and I'm again looking forward for a second. But if he if he's not compatible and is willing to get involved in a paired exchange, then he can go anywhere to get his transplant to, to donate because. Okay. Your organ's going to come from somebody else. You, you follow the the the, the mechanics yeah. there. Yeah. So you so, maybe. Uh, Go ahead. So should I call him up and talk to him about this? It was sort of a straight. He's an old old family friend, and it got pretty strained. Um, here, here. Let me offer something else. Yeah, I think you should call him up and it, you know walk through what I just described. Who knows what's okay. going to happen. But really, nothing's going to happen until you find out two things. One is if he's suitable, healthy enough to donate, and second, if he's compatible with you. So those two things need to be straightened out. And I would think he wouldn't object to going through the evaluation at another hospital. But you'd have to ask him that also. OK. And if you'd like, let me open up. Um, the opportunity uh, if he would want to talk to me. I, I'd be glad to talk to him. Okay, well that would be great and I can also, I, I was wondering if I could talk to you at more depth about this. Charlie Spaeth is who referred me to you. I don't know if you remember him. Sure, I remember Charlie. Yeah, yeah and nice. he, he, he's the one that told me to come on this. Great. And he, he, I would really like to talk to you personally and I don't know if you do that on the phone. Sure, sure. send me an email and, and we'll set something up, okay? Okay, that would be great. The other question I have is that I'm older. I'm 69. And so I'm finding it very difficult to find younger people or most of my friends are too old. Or they say they're too old. That's what well, the hospitals, the transplant centers are saying. Many hospitals still say they won't evaluate anyone over age 60 or 65, yeah. uh, but many, many transplants. Um, I, I've not looked, in, in, I'm, I'm not sure why, but I've not looked at the uh, age of recipients in the last couple of years. That would be an interesting stat to do, and I'm making a note now to kind of do it tomorrow. To look at the UNOS number ages over the last couple of years, and they break that out, uh, and that's something you can do too. Make a note, and and we can talk about that because getting that those stats might be helpful. It would, I think, it'd be really helpful because I yeah. keep running against a wall. I've had lots of potential donors, but they've been turned down. Okay, all right. Well, if they're turned down because they're not healthy enough to donate, certainly that's, that's one different. Thing. No, yeah. most okay. of them. Have haven't gotten past first base. They've just said you're too old. Well, then try another transplant hospital. If they're, well, if they're being disc discounted out of hand because of their age, I mean, I, I'll show you articles. People in their 70s and 80s are donating and receiving a transplant. Oh, uh, oh great. So okay. That that's you know again, it's not the age; it's the health of the individual. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. I, I'd like to talk to you more about that. Sure. Okay. Send me an email. We'll work that out. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. Jake, did you have a question? I'm trying to unmute you. Jake, did you have a question there? I think I'm still on with you. Yeah. I got. I just uh, turned it off. Sorry. Jake, are you there? Nope. Okay. I think Mike has a question for you. 
Go ahead, Mike. I didn't raise my hand. Or Mike, are you there? Mike, question? No? Okay. All right, I'll uh, leave it open for another minute or so if anyone has a question. Mike, once more? Nope. Okay. Any questions for Stephen? No? All right, Stephen, thanks for joining us. Appreciate uh, your taking the time. And uh, everyone else, I wish you the best. Um, I know it's difficult, but uh, there are donors out there. And uh, I think working hard to get there, you'll you'll hey, get some success. Hey, Harvey, before you go, sure. Mike, uh, Mike typed a question because he has no mic. Ah, he okay. Says, it says, my siblings are all out of state. If one of them or anyone else for that matter donates, do they need to travel back to my home location, Chicago, for the donor follow-up? Uh, typically what happens is for the donor follow-up, they'll uh, require the donor to stay in town. Uh, I know for Stephen, they required for a week, some say a week or two. So uh, that would be something that, that you could go over with the hospital. They should be able to let you know their policy beforehand. You know, that's, ob in, you know, uh, assuming nothing goes wrong. Hopefully that was helpful. And, yep, I see that now, Stephen, sorry. All right, uh, last chance uh, for anyone. All right. Um, again, thanks for joining and uh, wish everyone the best. Bye-bye.